buttons pushing. Oh, hey, buttons hey. pushing. Calling Chris Anderson in. Um, where are you? <laughs> uh, this week I'm in Stavlo. Uh, we're doing a site inspection for some trips. So I've been traveling around the Ardennes. Just finished up Market Garden. So yeah, I'm in Stavlo. And, and where are you? I am in the Chicago studio. So, you know, hanging out in the normal place. Welcome, everybody, to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours, offering a variety of history tours. Where, Chris? Uh, Europe. Europe. America. America. Asia. And the Pacific. The Pacific. Yeah, well, that's always, Pacific is always last. Okay. It? And the Pacific. Uh, and you can find out more about all of those great tours at stephenambrosetours.com. And whether you're watching live, watching on replay, or listening on the HHH podcast thank you for joining us today and we'll be talking today about the fall of france in 1940 and all that set in motion mm -hmm. and chris but before we do that we should just thank everybody who supports us via patreon Absolutely. Uh, especially really our top shelf that. patrons uh and here they are uh and there are many other patrons who support us at other various levels and you too can become a patron of history happy hour by going to patreon.com slash History happy hour, uh, oddly enough. And Chris, do we have any anybody there in the uh, in the viewership we seats? We, we do have a few, in fact. Uh, Xavier is joining us from from Barcelona, so we're excited to have Xavier back. And oh, uh, George Lowe's Jr., uh, Lizzie Borden from Hi, London. Hi, George. Hi, Lizzie. Uh, I see uh, Pierre and Heather uh, Brackenbacchus and Lorelei and Wally and lots of other names, familiar names and new names as well. So, um, Chris, I think we, uh, we've probably, um, killed enough time. we've probably killed enough time. What do you give me a cue and we'll get started. All right. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh. Don't give me the, okay. Now you can give me a cue. open the bars open and Chris wh uh, what what do we have on tap today yeah I'm I'm super duper excited about this and, and I'm a bit of a fanboy but today uh, we have uh, Michael Nyberg uh, who is the author of Potsdam the end of World War II and the remaking of Europe and dance of the Furies Europe and the outbreak of World War one and I first learned about uh, dr. Newt Nyberg from, from dance of the Furies and that was a book that I just loved years and years ago so when we got the uh, review copy of, of When France Fell, the book we're going to talk about um, this week, I was really excited. And then I read the book and I was blown away. So we're here to talk about uh, When France Fell. And um, yeah. So, and we welcome, welcome Michael Nyberg. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? Very Good. Yeah. You, we know that you're coming to us. You had to pull yourself away from the Pittsburgh Cleveland game. Yeah, which is uh, looks like it's not going to go the Steelers' way. So we'll just uh, oh, so that, we're just uh, going to let that on. go. Yeah, we're just going to forget about that. We're just going to move on. And, and <laughs> yeah. I, I see from one of our viewers that we're also competing with Stanford's women's volleyball and the Stanford women's basketball team. Not to mention, I think the Chicago Bears game just ended, but I don't know who won. So uh, we're we're just trying to fit this in amidst all the <laughs> the, the sports. Hoopla, and I know you're you're joining us from uh, from the the War College, right? U.S. Army War College in Carlisle. So yeah. so you are obviously not drinking there on the job, but Chris, do you have a cocktail today? I, I, I do. I do. Okay, and I've got one. So cheers to all that, uh, and uh, Chris, get us started. Yeah. Um. So we, obviously, um, the book uh, when France fell and its kind of importance. Uh, you, Michael, you you talk about. Um, that we should maybe look again at, at France. Uh, too often in World War II history, the France and the fall of France, we just kind of write that off and then we move on to the rest of the war. Uh, and you move France center stage. And one of the passages I want to read to get this started, uh, this is from the book. Um, and it says, the intellectual and political transformation necessary to transition from regional superpower to superpower began in 1940 when the American people and their government for the first time in history recognized two basic truths. truths. First, that they could no longer depend on the assistance or benign indifference of another country like France to ensure their own security. And second, that they face clear and present safety and security threats from across the Atlantic Ocean. So how did America find itself there and, and where have we lost that? Because obviously, as you say, this was an important relationship. 
Yeah, I think the assumption that that goes away in June of 1940, May, June 1940, is the assumption that France will do in 1940 what it did from 1914 to 1917, specifically that it'll hold the Germans off long enough to give the Americans time to make the decisions that America wants to make on America's own time schedule. So in other words, it will let us do what we did the last time. When France falls, uh, that map that looks so benevolent to American planners, people like Matthew Ridgway, who was in the War Plans Division at the time, now all of a sudden looks terrifying. If Morocco, Martinique, St. Pierre and Miquelon, uh, Dakar, Senegal, um, Indochina, if those become American enemies or if Germany just outright seizes them or Japan or Italy outright seizes them, and if the French fleet falls into Germany's hands, America's in a position it knows it, it, it's going to have an extremely difficult time. And there's a memo from Ridgway here in the archives here at the Army War College where Ridgway talks about in May, in, in, uh, excuse me, in late April of 1940, talking about how all he thought the United States needed to do was kind of upgrade some of its, its runways, maybe build a few more fuel storage facilities. In June 1940, he's talking about abandoning Guam, abandoning the Philippines, pulling everything back to the continental United States to defend what he thinks is no longer defensible. So it's that it's that in a flash change in the American security assumptions that is the thing that I think really pulls this country into the Second World War. Uh, it really gets this country believing that this policy of of outsourcing its defense to somebody else is simply not going to work anymore. A superpower, a great country like ours, simply can't behave that way. And that's the assumption of the summer of 1940. And you make the point uh, that uh, a lot of people think it's it's Pearl Harbor that kind of knocks us into oh my gosh we've got to we've got to build up our navy we've got to build up uh, our military forces etc. But that in reality it's the fall of France that does yeah. that. It's all done in June and July of 1940, and I talk about uh, this tremendous uh, debate that goes on in the United States. Um, I may get the numbers a little bit wrong, but it's something like the federal budget was nine billion dollars in June of 1940. In that month, the U.S. committed $12 billion for defense alone. So there is this tremendous shift where the Senate goes from saying, we don't need this, we don't need that, we don't need this, to saying, whatever it is you think we need, just build it. Uh, there's talk about a 4 million man army that George Marshall pairs down to a 2 million man army because he thinks 4 million is, is not defensible financially. Um, Roosevelt does something absolutely incredible, uh, especially to look at it from our polarized perspective right now. He replaces his Secretary of Army and Navy and he puts two big name Republicans into those jobs to create what is the American equivalent of a national emergency cabinet. So it, it is a it is a tremendous shock to the American psyche when that um, tremendous pillar of American defense that is the French Army and Navy just simply goes away and worse yet could end up in German hands. Right. So I, I think, again, just so we have kind of a baseline, can you just tell us a little bit about uh, where France stood in the world, uh, you know, before the war, before the war, and and why we place such reliance on it because it seems so yeah. foreign to us now. Yeah, I believe it's still the case that France has more more miles of border with other countries than any other European state, except I think Ukraine, Russia. Um, France still has an empire overseas. It's not the one that it once had, but in 1940, France outright controlled Algeria as a formal part of France. Tunisia was part of the empire. Morocco was a protectorate. France had colonies in the Caribbean, including Martinique, where the, the, the lone French aircraft carrier and the, most of the French gold supply was located. <coughs> Pardon me. France also gave me this uh, cold or whatever it is I'm getting over. Uh, so, you know, France was a worldwide great power, uh, as it still is in some ways today. Uh, but it controlled virtually all of North Africa, which meant it controlled those sea lanes. It had direct control over Senegal, which meant that it controlled the route over what American strategists called the Brazilian bump, which is that relatively short distance between Africa and the Americas. Uh, so, you know, it, it's a major power with a Navy to, to match it uh, and an overseas presence that, that could support it. So when France fell, the division of France into an occupied zone and an unoccupied zone, the unoccupied zone becomes a separate um, state called l'État français, the French state. We, we call it the Vichy French state because it's based in this small town of Vichy. And Vichy maintains full control over the empire and maintains full control over the Navy. So it's a very odd political animal that uh, the United States really struggled to get an understanding of, to try to figure out what it was, what it was likely to do, and what this transition meant for American security. And the answer is uh, nobody in the United States is entirely sure about any of those questions. 
So there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, a lot. And in, 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 in this book is, I, I have two pages of notes at the back of it from uh, from all the things I wanted to uh, think about bringing up today. But let, let's talk a little <laughs> bit about the French Navy. And I think this was, was I mean, I'd always kind of known that, that Vichy France maintained their navy, and then they end up scuttling it in November 1942. The British uh, attacked some of the uh, the French navy ships uh, uh, earlier in 1940, uh, and 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 that's a, a big story. But what really what surprises me is why didn't the Germans? The, the Germans had taken two million French soldiers prisoner. You would think that they would have a lot of trading cards, that they could have said, France, we really want that Navy. We really want that Navy. We'll give you back your prisoners, or if you don't give us the Navy, we'll do X, Y, and Z. Why? They, but the Germans seem to kind of be a little backed off about it and not try very hard. So is that because they just felt it was not going to be possible to get, or or was there something else going on? I think they certainly thought there was a good chance the French Navy would fight back. Uh, its morale did not break in 1940. Um, it still believed that it was the defender of the French Empire, which is the thing that virtually all French from the left to the right believed that the empire was integral to France and should remain French no matter what happened in the war. Um, but it's also the case that this is not the war that the Nazis want to fight. I mean, famously, Hitler came to Paris just one time, did not stay there long enough to eat a meal. Uh, they really wanted the Western Front to be calm. They wanted it to be reliably either neutral or pro-German, which they get from the Vichy French leaders. Uh, what they really wanted was to go east. So what they needed was to avoid the two-front dilemma of the First World War. Uh, putting, putting the screws to France too much would have made that more difficult. So until you know October, November 1942, maybe a bit earlier when the uh, mandatory labor drafts come in, uh, the goal for the German occupation of France is to keep it relatively light and push as much of the dirty work as it's possible to do onto local French officials, either Vichy or the Paris police or whomever they can do. So I think there's there's a number of reasons, but I think the two most important are the belief that if you ask for the French Navy, it will extend a war that you've already won and the fact that they really don't want to fight France. The, the war they want is in the east and they know from World War I, a two front war does not work in their benefit. Can I follow that, Chris, with a, just to say, just that the, na the, <laughs> the Navy, however, that French Navy is really on the minds of the, uh, both the U.S. and British planners, Absolutely. but they basically take diametrically opposite uh, uh, tax to it. Yeah, so the, the Navy, Jean-Francois Darlon, who is the head of the Vichy forces and the head of the Navy, he's an admiral, does come out and say, if anybody who is not French attempts to command this fleet, your orders, you French officers, your orders are to scuttle the fleet. And then he writes, even if I countermand this order in writing, mm -hmm. these orders remain. In other words, if the Germans put a gun to my head, ignore it, right? First orders are the valid orders. And this is what they do in 1942, rather than risk these ships falling into, um, falling into German hands. On the other hand, Darlan and the French Navy have no faith and no confidence whatsoever in the British, especially after the attack at Merz el Kabir that you mentioned, when the British attack a uh, part of the French fleet that's docked outside Algiers, outside Iran, <coughs> in July of 1940. Uh, so they're not going to sail those ships to Britain under any circumstances. Uh, they're going to try to maintain the neutrality of the French fleet. Uh, and that's the policy of the French Navy until they really have no chance, no choice, uh, in November 1942. So, so I mean, I, I think one of the, the difficulties is people have a hard time getting their head or their arms around Vichy, you know, one, one of the, the descriptions in the book is you say it's a banana republic without bananas. Um, so maybe you could you tell us a little bit, well, what does Vichy want? I mean, so know, there we, is a, we know what the Germans want, but what does Vichy want? What do they expect? Yeah. So the, the, the thing that's most important to understand, and I can get into this if you guys want, is that what Vichy really wants is internal stuff. They want domestic policy stuff. They want, in effect, to undo a lot of the effects of the French Revolution. They want to undo a lot of the effects of the Third Republic government that had been running France from the 1870s until 1940. From a foreign policy perspective, what they believe uh, is that Germany, Europe's great land power, and Britain, its great sea power, cannot defeat the other one, that the, what, Europe will enter into a period of stalemate. They also believe that there will be a peace conference, like the Paris Peace Conference of 1919. So in their most optimistic moments, what they think they're going to do 
is play the kind of role of balancer at, at this peace conference between the land power and the sea power and figure out a way to get back for France uh, most of what it had lost in 1940. It'll lose Alsace-Lorraine, maybe it'll lose its protectorate over Morocco, but it'll move back to Paris, probably to the government will move back to Versailles uh, because most of the Vichy leaders were not crazy about Paris, which they saw as a left-wing kind of troublesome kind of place. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in the end, France would come out of this with its empire, and it would come out of this with the capital back in the Paris region. Um, people who observed Vichy kind of realized they weren't going to get this. Uh, but, you know, there's a there's a chance that at a post-war peace conference, they can do better than what they were doing then. Among the things that undermines that strategy, of course, is the German invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, which makes this war a very, very different war. So I tell folks here when we talk about this here at the Army War College, um, it was a lousy strategy, but I mean, give them credit, they had a strategy, and let's evaluate it on the terms of what they thought they were gonna be able to accomplish. And that's what they think they're gonna do. So to get back to Rick's question earlier, if you give up the fleet, you lose one of the instruments you have toward attaining that strategy. It does seem like they're a little bit suffering from fairly major delusions. Um, yeah, about... it certainly seems that way in retrospect. Um, I mean, the other the... element in, in this is Italy, which has placed some demands on France. It wants Corsica, it wants Tunisia, um, it wants Nice. So having the fleet in place and being a major international player, in effect, helps them keep Italy at arm's length as much as it does Germany. One of the interesting characters in your book was somebody who I had never heard of, René de Chambrun. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about who he was and the role he played in June 1940 and thereafter? Yeah, I'm smiling because um, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking to you from the brand new academic building we just opened up. In my old academic building, there is an American flag that flew over the Marquis de Lafayette's grave, and it was given to the Army War College by René de Chevron. Um, and uh, I don't know what's happening to that flag. I think it's probably still in the old building, but I have this image of it ending up in the Indiana Jones warehouse. <laughs> so I'm constantly asking people, please don't do that to the flag. Um, <coughs> Chevron's a fascinating guy. He's a member of the old French nobility. Um, he is a direct descendant of the Marquis de Lafayette, which means he's a statutory American citizen. He has family connections on the American side through his mother. He is related to Nicholas Longworth, who was the Speaker of the House of Representatives, and maybe more importantly, was married to Theodore Roosevelt's daughter, Alice Roosevelt, uh, about whom Theodore once said, I can either govern the country or I can govern Alice. No man can expect me to do both. Uh, he's also connected to the new Prime Minister of Vichy France, Pierre Laval. Uh, that's his father-in-law. So when France uh, falls, Laval sends Chambron to the United States with the mission of telling him, look, keep the Americans on side. Make sure you keep the Americans pro-French. So he came to the United States in June 1940. He spent a weekend on the presidential yacht with Franklin Roosevelt. He then met with Alice Roosevelt. These are two very different branches of the Roosevelt family. Um, Alice loathed Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. And Chambron leveraged those ties uh, through Franklin Roosevelt. He met with members of the American Center and Left. Through Alice, he met members of the American Center and Right, and he went to literally any audience that would listen to him. And what he said was, uh, France, France is making the best out of this situation, but it wants to remain pro-American, it will remain anti-communist, and it will remain neutral. And this vision of, of, of what the new France would be is incredibly appealing to Americans. Uh, Chambron went on to write uh, a book called I, I Saw France Fell, that he, in which he blamed the fall of France on communists. He ended up at Stanford, where he worked there for a little while, came back to France at the end of the war, and defended several of the key collaborationists in their post-war trials, including Coco Chanel, uh, who was up for uh, major charges of collaboration, and he was, his, uh, he was her uh, legal defense. So this fascinating guy, he's kind of a zealot figure who kind of pops up everywhere, uh, who's kind of been forgotten because, um, I mean, as late as 1975, he's giving my institution flags. Uh, but after that, his name hasn't meant quite as much as it used to. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, well, why do we, could you talk a little bit about some of the personalities that are leaving Vichy? Because obviously uh, there's Marshal Patton, uh, and yep. there's a whole lot to unpack there. Uh, there's Laval. And I, I'm, I'm curious about some of these personalities that are, are, are leaders of Vichy in your book, um, our fascination with them, our attachment to them. Yep. Uh, and also, did they really think that, they were being legitimate. I mean, that that's 
They did. The argument they made was that the Third Republic National Assembly had voted full powers to them. And the Americans agreed with this argument, by the way. Therefore, legally, the Third Republic transfers to Vichy. And if you go to the American embassy in Paris today, on the wall where they list all of the American ambassadors, Leahy is listed as ambassador to France. So we, we recognize that argument. I mean, even today, Leahy's name is on that wall. So their argument is we are the legitimate government of France. This is why they tried de Gaulle for treason in absentia and convicted him. Mm -hmm. um, we can go into the individual personalities. I was just in the cemetery where Laval is, bar is buried with a French friend of mine. And I asked him, do you want to take a walk you know, through the cemetery? It's one of these beautiful you know, French cemeteries. And he said, well, you know, the only reason I would go through is to make sure that Laval is still under there. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. um, <clears throat> what they all have in common is that they are anti-French, they are anti-Third Republic. They believe it's a kind of stab in the back myth of its own, that France did not fall in 1940 because of anything that the army did. It fell because of the rottenness of the socialists, the immigrants, the Jews that had corrupted the French Third Republic. Uh, mm. They want to... I mean, they do. They take away Bastille Day as a holiday. They take away La Marseillaise as an anthem. Uh, they um, replace the French uh, liberty, fraternity, equality with work, family, fatherland. Uh, Robert Paxton, the great American historian, argued that Vichy was not this kind of German creation. In fact, what it was, was a very French uh, anti-revolutionary, anti-Third Republic that wanted to pull France back to a France that was governed by the Catholic Church, that was patriarchal, that was, uh, for the most part, rural, based on peasant farmers. Uh, they wanted to get the church back into education, all of those things that they wanted to do. So in many ways, you can understand Vichy by understanding it as a response to the many of the things that came out of the French Revolution. They want to go back to a more conservative, rural uh, kind of France. Most of them, however, are not dyed-in-the-wool ideological fascists. They see fascism as being a kind of modernist ideology, and what they really want to do is go backwards. So they are ultra conservative. They are reactionary. But for the most part, Pétain uh, has very little time for the real hardcore ideological fascists. They are vehemently anti-communist. Uh, they are anti-Jewish. They are anti-Freemason, all of that kind of stuff. Mm. So what they really want is a France that will be stable enough to allow them to enact that kind of a domestic uprooting of the French system. That's really what they want. Um, yeah, I mean, I can talk more about some of the individuals that are at play here, but but as a group, that's what they're trying to do. Okay. Well, I mean, that, go ahead, Chris. Well, it's, what, what struck me is, you know, Baton, obviously, he has a legacy, he has an image, he has an aura. Okay, I can I can get I can understand maybe people are are, are drawn to him, but people like Laval, I yeah. mean, he <laughs> thoroughly odious human being. Thoroughly odious, yeah. Um, um, but he is a he is a consummate political insider. I mean, he he knew how to play the game in 1930s France. Uh, he was a time man of the year once upon a time. Um, he's a technocrat. He understands how government works. He understands how to get things done the way that he wants to get them done. Uh, Pétain is a figurehead. He's 80 years old. Um, he needs naps. Uh, sometimes to wake him up, you have to say Charles de Gaulle, and then he'll <laughs> wake up. And wait. <laughs> True story. That's that's one way they wake him up in, in meetings. Um, <laughs> And it, but it's Laval, that, it's Laval that knows how to put a cabinet together, knows how to keep a cabinet in order, um, knows how to put the right people in the right place so that his legislative agenda can get pushed through. Um, you know, very few people in Vichy trust him. Very few Americans trust him. And one of the things the Americans are trying to figure out, who ultimately calls the shots? If it's Pétain, then Vichy might be a gamble we're taking. If, in fact, it's Laval, then we, we have to approach this in a very, very different way. So... That's why my friend Sylvain was, you know, we were joking, like we're, the only reason to walk through the cemetery is to make sure that, you know, Laval is still under there. Right. Um, he, he's not a figure that, um, well, I think everybody agreed. The post-war trial in 45 that they did on him was rushed and probably not the fairest of trials, but nobody except Chambron, his son-in-law, particularly cared when he was executed. You know, it's one of these, yeah. put him in the cemetery and, you know, put enough cement up there so nothing weird happens. Just <laughs> just keep him down there. Uh, Peyton, there was and still is a kind of, well, you know, he was a great man in the First World War. What do we do about his behavior in the second? It's a minority view in France, but you do still see it. Yeah, yeah, you did, yeah, you yeah, talked yeah. about Macron uh, getting in trouble yeah. over that uh, in the uh, anniversary year. Yeah, Macron tried to use the, the centennial as a kind of way to sort of, you know, throw a bone to, to say, well, look, Peyton did great things in the First World War, and we ought not to forget that. And he got this firestorm of anger back 
uh, that he had to walk back that comment pretty quickly. So I want to bring in a question from one of our audience members. Um, he says, okay, the military and political establishments were shocked when France fell, but did the American public understand their peril? Yes. So it's pretty obvious to me. One of the arguments I make in the book is that this, this deal we made with Vichy was unbelievably unpopular. Um, American journalists criticized it. Dr. Seuss, uh, Theodore Geisel, the, the name he was using then, uh, drew vicious cartoons criticizing the policy. Um, and one of the reasons I think why the Americans make the decision to invade North Africa is to figure out a way to rescue themselves from this policy. It is incredibly unpopular among the American people that we're going to we're going to do a deal with Vichy, who are not only obviously pro-German, they are obviously anti-British. Uh, we've chosen the wrong side in this. Uh, we, we've made a tremendous mistake. Roosevelt's, Roosevelt's policy in North Africa is incredibly unpopular. Uh, so I think there was an awareness among the American people. The movie Casablanca is one of my favorite examples of this. That movie is made while all this <laughs> stuff is going on. And of course, one of the very last scenes of that movie is uh, Captain Reno dropping a bottle of Vichy water into the garbage can. Uh, the next time you, you see that film, uh, take note. And please note that the American directors did not believe that an American audience needed to have that explained to them. All they needed to see was a bottle of Vichy water going into a wastebasket. And they, that, that's all you had to do. Nothing else had to be explained. Um, so yes, the, 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 the American people knew what was going on. And for the most part, they were not happy with the way that the United States had been dealing with Vichy. And, cool. and we we know, and I'm not going to ask a question, but we do note that your your love of the movie Casablanca comes through in your chapter headings, which are all quotes from the movie. So yeah, that was a little game. I don't know what I was on a flight somewhere, and somehow that idea <laughs> popped into my head. My my fantastic editor Kathleen McDermott at Harvard, with whom I've done a couple of books, I, I'm I'm notoriously bad at picking titles, both of books and of chapters. I'm really bad at it. Kathleen's really good at it. And we were having a difficult time. And I think I was flying home from Germany or someplace. And I just took out my notebook and I just sketched it. And I wrote it up and I said, look, these actually fit. Can we do this? And we had this sort of back and forth. And the two uh, peer reviewers that read the manuscript, one said, no, don't do it. And the other one said, oh my God, this is fantastic. So it was kind of a last minute coin flip and we decided to go for it. And I'm really glad that we did. So so, so again, we were, you, touched, you just touched on this, but I think we should probably <laughs> kind of explain what our policy is um, and how unpopular it is. You know, I have a quote here from uh, Samuel Grafton from the book. It says, why do we recognize fascism when it's called Hitler, but not when it's called Patan? Why does a simple change of a name that would not fool a hotel clerk bewilder our State Department? Yeah. So, so what cool. is our policy and where does it come from? Like, how does it start? The policy is to send uh, Admiral William Leahy, one of the most trusted people in the United States government, the man who will become the first chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, to send him to Vichy as the American ambassador to France. Not to Vichy France, to France. Mm -hmm. And again, his name is on the wall when you go into that beautiful embassy that the U.S. has uh, right there on the Place de la Concorde in Paris. His name is listed as if he were any other American ambassador to any other French government. So even today, we still acknowledge that we, we did this. Uh, so there is an official diplomatic acknowledgement of Vichy, which drove the British absolutely insane that we were we were doing this. You can imagine Charles de Gaulle's response to this. Um, <laughs> we actually send limited amounts of food, fuel and uh, cooking oils and things like that to Vichy, although we're careful in the way that we try to manage it so that those supplies don't end up um, in, in Germany one way or the other. We do some transfers of money. We do all kinds of things uh, that essentially treat the Vichy French government as a normal, regular government. And um, it's deeply unpopular outside of the State Department. It's deeply unpopular in other parts of the, of the Roosevelt administration. And it's incredibly unpopular among uh, American journalists and war correspondents, the vast majority of whom, of course, knew France very well, because it, all, almost all of them had come through there in the yeah. 1930s. So um, <clears throat> that comment uh, from Grafton is, is one of many. But um, you know, it, it, it gets to the point, as does Casablanca, as does Dr. Seuss, that this this policy is just not taking the United States in the direction that it ought to be going. So, but, so but we continue know, to pursue it. I'm sorry. Yeah, why? Why why does Roosevelt do that? Yeah, I think there's a couple of reasons. I think the Americans are convinced by Chembron on in the first part. I think there are things about the Vichy French government that Americans find appealing. 
Uh, they like its anti-communist stance. They like the fact that it at least uh, plays that it's going to be pro-American. Um, the road on which the, the, the small hotel where the Vichy French government is set up is named the Avenue des États-Unis. Uh, that's not, I mean, that's a, that's a classic kind of you know, diplomatic gesture. Um, so there were things that the Americans liked. On the other side, it's not immediately obvious what the alternative is. Uh, it's not going to be Charles de Gaulle until really almost D-Day. Um, in fact, it probably is about D-Day. When, um, when, when the United States finally admits that no matter how much it dislikes Charles de Gaulle, Charles de Gaulle is the leader of France. Um, until then, de Gaulle is nothing more than a self-proclaimed, he's the youngest brigadier general in the French army who goes to London and says, I am France. That, that's, that's not good enough for Roosevelt and the State Department. Well, he's also probably the tallest brigadier general in the French <laughs> he's army. The, he's the, if my friend Pierre Samuel is listening, Pierre Samuel is the only Frenchman I've ever met who is as tall as de Gaulle was. Um, <laughs> The United States played with a guy by the name of Henri Giraud, another very tall guy, uh, hoping that he might provide an alternative to both. And Giraud is simply not up for the role. So it's not immediately obvious to the Americans what, what you do. If you break with uh, Vichy, what is the diplomatic alternative? So I think they stay with Vichy longer than they should have, in part because some of them are convinced by what Chambron and others have been telling them. Some of them loathe de Gaulle so much that they're willing to take whatever the opposite is. And... For many others, there is simply no alternative. So I, know, I, it's, I think it's your turn, Chris. Uh, so, so maybe you should talk about or just touch briefly on some of this revolving cast of characters that we decide are the next solution to France before we get to the Gaulle. Meanwhile, of course, the British have said, you know, he might be odious, but he's our guy. Yeah, he is odious, but he's our guy. Um, <coughs> you know, the Americans... The people around Roosevelt, um, a lot of people from a lot of different perspectives, talked about how much Roosevelt wanted to play a role in the creation of France when the war was over, the rebuilding of France. Yeah. He wanted France to have elections. He hoped that those elections would produce somebody other than Charles de Gaulle. Um, but he wanted to shape France. And de Gaulle had a very interesting observation about Robert Murphy, the senior American diplomat who's dealing with, with France. And he said that Murphy's idea of France are the people he dined with in Paris. In other words, that the Americans don't really understand France. They right. understand Paris, right? And I think there's a lot in that critique. Um, so there is a kind of way in which the Americans are looking for people. The problem is virtually every politician in France is going to be poisoned either by their behavior in the Third Republic and the fall of France or their connection to Vichy. There aren't a lot of people who, are, who have hands clean in both. What that means is it's not unlikely that it's going to be a military person who's going to be in charge of France when the thing is over. Mm -hmm. That means you could end up with a model like Franco in Spain, which the Americans don't particularly want. And there are some Americans who think that's what de Gaulle is trying to be. There are other Americans who think, well, de Gaulle is going to be the historical analogy that's most often used is Alexander Kerensky, who came in after the Tsar fell in 1917 and was so ineffective that the communists had a revolution and pushed him out. So what the Americans don't want is for France to end up a kind of Franco-like Spanish state or to become a communist state. Mm -hmm. And they're afraid that de Gaulle in power could produce one of those two outcomes. On the other hand, there is no immediately obvious civilian politician that you could run in an election in France as soon as the war is over and expect that that person is going to win. So it's a very unsettled uh, situation, so unsettled, in fact, that the American army actually plans for a full occupation of France and to treat it as if it is a defeated country rather than a liberated one. It goes by the, the acronym AMGOT. Uh, and again, you can imagine what happens to de Gaulle's blood pressure when he finds out that the Americans are planning a full occupation of France. Wow. If, if they want to wake him up, they just say AMGOT. Uh, just say AMGOT. Uh, I, I just want to tell, remind everybody that we are speaking with Michael Nyberg, who is the author of When France Fell. Uh, and uh, we thank him so much for being here. And Michael, I want to bring another question up from an audience member uh, and add a little twist of my own. This is from Lynn Hargrove, and Lynn says, Did the fall of France, coupled with the defeat of the British in France, cause the U.S. military to reassess the British? And and so one part of this question is, did, did it cause the Americans to reassess the British? The other part is, talk about the the divide you know churchill's trying to make nice with the u.s but this um the policy over vichy is a big dividing factor between america and britain at this time 
Yeah, it is the single one thing that is driving American and British policy in opposite directions. And in fact, uh, there's not once but twice Cordell Hull threatens resignation or actually almost goes ahead with it over Fishy. Uh, so there's something going on between the U.S. and Britain. The U.S. wants Britain to hew to its way of thinking about things. And the British are the ones kind of saying, look, you don't really understand Europe. Like we live here. You don't. Right. You, you went back after 1919. We understand what's going on here. Um, ironically, and I just had this discussion in France with a British uh, academic friend of mine, the, the British attack on Merz el-Kabir, the French fleet in North Africa in uh, July of 1940, actually makes the Americans think, OK, the British are in this. They're going to fight. They're not going to cut a separate deal. Now, the British are very proud of this and the British still to this day sort of defend it. The French answer is, look, if, if, if the argument that they're going to fight the Germans is that they're willing to kill 1,200 neutral French sailors, we have a very odd definition of wanting to stay in the war, right? They've now killed more French people through the course of the war than they have Germans. So it creates a really unusual, I would argue, almost unprecedented situation, both diplomatically and militarily. What the Americans <clears throat> do, however, is make the decision uh, that they're going to have to support Britain, whether they want to or don't want to. I mean, Lend-Lease is a part of all of this. Destroyers for bases is a part of the fall of France, too. Um, <clears throat> but where the Americans and British disagree is on the diplomatic approach to France and whether or not um, Vichy should be seen as a German entity, which is what the British think, of course, or a neutral state, which is what the Americans are still hoping that it will turn into. Um, the other result, of course, is that when the British did attack the French fleet at Merz el Kabir, the Americans technically protest and say what the British did was was illegal by attacking a neutral state. But privately, they say, OK, that's X number of capital ships in the French fleet. We don't have to worry about tracking anymore. This actually makes our lives a little bit easier. So can, can you talk a little bit, too, about um, what well, Cordell Hull uh, plays a big part in this story um, and, and talk about that. But also um, there's one um, kind of moment that you talk about in the book that it's sort of comic opera, but not, but the, 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 the Miquelon, um, invasion, because they have, there, there's, there's an invasion off the coast, coast of North America that most people. Yeah. I had about. never heard of this. And when you yes, read about it, you're like, this, complete this, news to me. This is a comic opera. Yeah. But at the time yeah. it, it's very serious stuff. Yeah. There's two little islands off the coast of Newfoundland, uh, St. Pierre and Miquelon. They were then and are still French. Uh, they are uh, pro Vichy, at least the governor is pro Vichy. Uh, American intel says that the vast majority of people who are living there want nothing to do with Vichy. They want nothing to do with the war. They kind of want to be left alone. I mean, and it's, it's a, a couple small, of thousand people, right? It's, yeah, three it's or a couple thousand people that fish, you know, they fish and I don't know, I'm not, I mean, it's, it's they rocks. They fish and I speak mean, French. There's, there's yeah, they, 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 they speak a strange version of French. You can't really grow crops there. Um, they were they were prohibition um, um sanctuaries during the prohibition era rum runners would go back and forth right there, there's nothing there uh there's no airstrip there's no port i mean there, there's nothing there uh de gaulle nevertheless uh sends a couple of free french navy ships there and gets the governor to leave takes over control of the radio station and declares it part of free france uh, th this should be this should be a non-issue this should be if ever there was a tempest in a teapot this ought to be it uh -huh. cordell hull somehow took this as an affront to the monroe doctrine um, cut his Christmas vacation short and came back and threatened to resign unless President Roosevelt uh, stood up and said, you got to kick these guys out. These guys have to go, like even if we have to force them out. So they eventually work out a compromise where the, a new governor is put in place. Uh, the radio transmitter is a, becomes a free French radio transmitter. The Canadians are saying to the Americans, look, like you, you are there is trust us. There is nothing there. Like there's not even a, a decent poutine there. Like there's nothing. There. Like you know, leave it alone. Forget it. Like just just forget it. And eventually, somebody talks Cordell Hall uh, down from this. But the fact that he was willing to cut a vacation short at Christmas and threaten resignation over the issue just shows you just how raw this issue of France was to Americans, and how much the Americans were, I think, trying to carve an independent vision of the post-war world apart from Britain and apart from even Canada, that we were going to do this our way uh, without allies if we had to. And I think some of that speaks to the way that the First World War ended, where a lot of Americans felt that that Wilson and the Americans had been kind of bullied by Clemenceau and Lloyd George into a post-war world vision that they didn't want. And this is, I think, part of that from Cordell Hall. I think it's also true that Hall um, Hall's a hard guy to read 
My own sense is he'd been in that job a very, very long time. The world had changed a great deal while he was in that job, and he was very slow to adapt American diplomacy as, as, a, as a kind of coercive instrument to the new world of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. I'm going to circle back to something we touched on uh, in January 1941. So this would be six months after uh, Germany has uh, 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 conquered or signed an armistice with with France, and the uh, the Vichy France has been created. In January 41, Roosevelt appoints Admiral. William Leahy as his ambassador to Vichy. Now, Leahy is not just some retired admiral who's sitting around. Uh, he's a guy who will eventually become FDR's chief of staff, uh, essentially the first uh, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, sort of unofficially. Um, and so this obviously tells us that, the, that Roosevelt views the relationship with Vichy as being very important. What does FDR want Leahy to do, and kind of what is Leahy's reaction in the, the year and, and uh, I guess, six months that he's there, or four months that he's there in France? Well, the most important thing Leahy is supposed to do is figure out what Vichy is. Who's actually running the show? Um, he actually, Roosevelt first picked John Pershing as ambassador. That, that's, I mean, if you can think of anybody in the American system weightier with more gravitas than, than Leahy, it would be Pershing, uh, who declined on grounds of, of poor health. Uh, and later wrote Leahy the most beautiful note saying, you know, the, the president has found somebody much more capable than me. It really, this lovely note that Pershing wrote to Leahy. So the first thing Leahy is supposed to do is figure out what the heck Vichy is, uh, who's running it, what is the Navy going to do, uh, what is the empire going to do? And he's supposed to use whatever influence, whatever instruments he has at his disposal to try to slowly but surely wean Vichy to the American side. Um, <coughs> and Leahy's reports back home quickly say, look, this, this, this thing is a basket case. This thing has no, the Vichy has no real independent ability to cut its own foreign policy. Um, the, as long as the Germans are sitting in Paris, as long as the Germans have hundreds of thousands of French POWs, Vichy is not an independent state. Therefore, its neutrality is really in name only. It is a pro-German political entity. Fétain is weak. Um, the people underneath him are vying for power. Uh, it, it's, it's, not, it's not something we can build a, a system on. And Roosevelt's response back to Leahy is, I, I need you to stay there. Uh, I need you to be the president. Sorry, I can't the hear you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and Leahy, like a good, a good, I shouldn't say soldier, a good sailor, uh, does what the president asked him to do even though his wife uh, died of an embolism, uh, embolism mm. while, while they were in Vichy. And even though Leahy, I mean, quite clearly realized this policy, it's not going to work. It's, it's just not doing what it needs to do. Uh, and so uh, there's so much in this book that when you look at it through the prism of America's relationship with France and Vichy France, uh, it really changes your focus on the war. But one of the things that really fascinated me was the impact of um, our policy towards Vichy and the fall of France on the war in the Pacific, um, because that, that's a connection we don't usually make. What can you just tease that a little bit and talk about some of the impact of that? You know, the first thing I, I want to do, I want to say thank you, because that's exactly what I wanted the book to do, is to say, if you don't ignore France from the fall of France to D-Day, if you actually take France seriously as an international actor, or even something that's acted upon, the, the, the war looks quite different uh, right. than, it, than it did. And I think that's really, really important. Um, <coughs> pardon me for the coughing again. Um, in the Pacific, you know, Indochina is a Vichy, is part of the French Empire. Uh, the United States now has to think about uh, what the, the fall of France means for the Pacific theater. Uh, France cannot be the kind of ally that can help to support any operations that you want to do. Uh, France could be a potential hindrance to that. And it just, the, the, the reality of the empire in the post-war world just gets more and more confused. When the French allowed Japan to come into Indochina, it is about then that Roosevelt made the decision that after the war, France does not get Indochina back. It's going to go into an international trusteeship. We're going to do something else with it. So this very weird, long, complicated history that the United States is about to have with Indochina does begin with trying to figure out who should have it, what should it belong to, what kind of principles ought to guide it, and what right does France have to reclaim it when all of this is over. And the, the, the Vichy experiment, the deal they cut with Japan uh, certainly doesn't help, even though Japan, uh, Vietnamese, sorry, Vichy officers went to the United States and said, look, what do you want us to do? And the mm -hmm. Americans who advise the, the French say, look, 
There's nothing you can do. You've got no support coming from Paris. You're on your own out here in the middle of Southeast Asia. The Japanese want something from you. You've got no choice but to give it to them. So, you know, it's a situation where the French are in a, a virtually impossible position. Um, and it's fascinating. Uh, Philippe Leclerc, one of the great heroes of France coming out right. of this, the guy whose second armor division liberated Paris, um, you know, is great a hero in France. Every French town, every French everything is going to have an Avenue Leclerc somewhere pretty prominent. At the end of the war, he went to Indochina and said, you know, that's right. After the Vichy years, uh, we cannot come back here. You know, the same thing that they said about Syria and Lebanon, like we, we simply can't go back after the Vichy interregnum. We have to give these places up. Uh, and of course, the French didn't listen to him in Indochina. He died in a plane crash shortly thereafter. But, you know, how much grief and how much agony could have been avoided if Leclerc's vision had come had come to pass then? And and you suggest that um, uh, it was because of that move into Indochina, or it's it's related that uh, FDR cut off the oil supply to Absolutely. to Japan, which which is eventually what leads Japan to attack. The United States, so that you can tie that back to Vichy as well. Absolutely. I mean, the, the timing of the way that things go, I mean, I don't want to make too much of this, but I think we often try to tell ourselves the history of our own wars, that we're sitting here minding our own business until the USS Maine blows up or um, Pearl Harbor gets attacked. We're sort of minding our own business until X happens. It's not that that narrative is necessarily wrong, but it ignores everything that happens before X, right? So the United States making this decision to embargo oil and scrap metal and all the other coercive instruments we tried with Japan are precipitating factors to the attack on Pearl Harbor. They don't excuse it under any circumstances, but they do help explain why the Japanese make the decision that they make. And those decisions are in turn conditioned by Vichy France. Um, and the same thing is true, as I note in another part of the book, and I don't know if you want to get into it, uh, the first time Americans realize what the Germans are doing to the Jews of Europe, right, that right. also relates to Vichy. So again, if you just shift your focus a little bit, Again, as, as, as Chris said, the, the, the war, you get a different prism to look through the war and you see many more colors than you saw before. Yeah, well, Michael, maybe I'll bring in a question. You, you mentioned the Jewish policy and we had a question from uh, one of our viewers. While he says, does Roosevelt have any problems with the Vichy's anti-Jewish tendencies? We're, we're supporting this regime yeah. that is anti-Semitic at the same yeah, time. Um, we're, uh, there's no record I can find of the United States ever pushing Vichy to behave differently. Uh, this is also true, I should note, after Operation Torch, when the U.S. Okay. cuts a deal with the Vichy officials who are in North Africa, uh, that they will support us militarily in the chase to get the Germans out of Tunisia, and we will in turn let their domestic policies be wholly French matters. And that means that the anti-Semitic laws stay on the books. So if the American officials cared about it, they were really unwilling to do very much about it. And remember, even the Veldiv roundups, which occur in the July of 1942, the roundup of, of thousands of Jews, including Jewish children, who later get dispatched to Auschwitz, uh, even that didn't change American policies, although Cordell Hall did make a statement about it. Um, so the simple answer is no. Um, the more complicated answer is to have raised an issue about it could well have led Vichy or the Germans to say, well, if you don't like the way we're behaving with Jews, which is something the Germans did a lot in the 30s, we will happily ship the Jews to you if you'll take them in. And of course, the American answer to that is no, uh, we have a quota system in place. They can't come here. <laughs> so, again, a, a lot of this ties back to France. A lot of this ties back to the way that uh, America's relationship with Vichy is constantly causing it to twist in ways that don't always sit well with our image of the World War II today, and even the contemporary one, you know, this is not a four freedoms, Norman Rockwell type yeah. of policy that the US is running. Uh, and I think that's part of the reason why this history doesn't always fit into the standard histories we tell about ourselves. Was there an alternate policy that would make sense? Have you kind of war gamed that out? What if Chambrun hadn't been there in June of 1940. What if Roosevelt was outraged and took a hard line? I mean, what, what, what is the alternative that we could have taken towards Vichy and how might things have been different if we had? I think there's a very simple and obvious and well discussed alternative, which is not to recognize anything. Right? Don't send Leahy. Um, you know, work with Vichy in the background, work with it indirectly to the extent that it, that it serves American interests. But don't send an ambassador. Don't don't recognize. Don't put the weight and gravitas of the United States 
the most important neutral nation in the world, the nation that says it's standing up for liberty and freedom and everything else, um, don't put the gravitas of that state behind Pierre Laval, quite simply. Or if you do, put conditions on it. Laval has to go from the government, um, maybe if you wanted to be serious about it, that the anti-Jewish, uh, the Crimea laws, as they're called, those have to go away. Um, if you're going to give something as important as U.S. recognition, make sure you're getting something back. If you want to put it in hard interest. The other alternative, of course, was on the table because the British did it, which is to say we don't recognize Vichy. Uh, we see it as an illegal pro-German puppet regime. We're inclining toward Charles de Gaulle. Problems, though, we know there are in this. We are recognizing uh, a free French independent movement just as we are. The, 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 the free Dutch, the free Danes, the free Norwegians, we're recognizing them all. Uh, we know there are issues and we know we're going to have to handle this politically when the war is over. Uh, but until that time, if we're going to make political and moral compromises, we're going to err on the side of the people who are not cutting deals with Germany. So those two things were certainly on the table. So it's not a question of what if and, you know, dreaming up something that was not discussed. Um, both of those alternatives were discussed. So it was possible to do either one of those two things. So uh, towards the end of the book, as we're, we're bu busy digesting all of this other stuff that totally changed how you look at World War II, um, you talk about a little bit about the legacy of this. Um, because again, these decisions have long-term effects that we're sort of dealing with now. So maybe you know, as we're getting to the, the end of our time, talk a little bit about the legacy of these decisions because we're still dealing with this policy. Yeah, I think, you know, I was just in France. I took a group, uh, walked around, the, did a little liberation of Paris. And I, I always show them uh, near Notre Dame Cathedral and many places in France, thousands of them. You'll see these, this, this metal white placard that is uh, the speech that de Gaulle gave on the BBC radio on June yep. 18, 1940. And I always stop groups and read that and tell them it is the only statement by a political leader in 1940 that comes true word for word. So whatever one wants to say about de Gaulle, uh, the, the, the joke I used one time with a group was, um, if I were American, I would have wanted him in prison. If I were French, I would want everything that's not named after him renamed after him now uh, for lots of reasons, for, because of what he did for France. But what he said in 1940 was, France has lost this battle, but France has not lost a war. This is, this is going to be a long game. And when France recovers its dignity, when it recovers its glory, when it recovers its sovereignty, France will be present and France will return to what it was. And somehow, after everything that happened to France, it nevertheless comes out of the war with no American occupation, with uh, a, a, an occupation zone inside Germany, with a seat on the UN Security Council and a charter membership in NATO. Now, all that happens with Charles de Gaulle fully aware that the Americans went with Pétain first, then they went with Henri Giraud, this experiment that I talked about that didn't work, then they cut a deal with Admiral Darlan, who might be as loathsome as Laval. <laughs> Only because he, de Gaulle, gave them no other choices did they recognize him as president of France. Now, I don't think anybody could have known that de Gaulle was going to remain the most important public figure, arguably, in Europe until 1968-69 when he steps down. So this relationship is incredibly complicated. So I talk to military audiences all the time. Um, the U.S.-France relationship is an incredibly complex one for lots of reasons. But in no short reason, it is Charles de Gaulle's awareness that America was willing to sacrifice French sovereignty and sacrifice French security and France's mere existence in order to serve America's own interests. So when France develops an independent nuclear uh, uh, capability, which it still has, when France withdrew from the NATO um, um, military planning arm in 1966. Americans read this as, as the French being anti-American. The French understood it as a way to guarantee their own security and sovereignty because of their conviction based on the World War II policy that the United States was willing to do a lot of things that would have undermined and maybe even done away with that safety and security. So I don't think you can understand anything about the US-French relationship, even, even I would say even up to today, without an understanding of the way that the Second World War ended and the way that this relationship with Charles de Gaulle and the Americans continued on. Um, I can give you one more example. Go for it. I was at the Merdere River just about a month ago um, with a group of folks where James Gavin fought. Mm -hmm. sure. And I, at the very end of it, <clears throat> I said, 
The Eisenhower's relationship with Charles de Gaulle and the French was terrible. When Kennedy came in, he needed an ambassador that the French trusted. He needed somebody to help reset and repair that relationship. And the guy he picked to be U.S. ambassador to Vichy France, to, uh, excuse me, U.S. ambassador to France in 1961 was none other than Gavin. And the very first thing James Gavin did, he asked for every bit of documentation he could get about William Leahy and what Leahy had done as ambassador to Vichy. Because he wanted to understand where all of these scars, where all of this um, pain and all of these difficult spots in France in the relationship had come from. And I'm internally grateful to him because because of that, we have a full copy of all of Leahy's correspondence here in the Gavin files here in Carlisle which made it possible for me to finish writing this book without having to travel during the COVID period. So again, everything comes together and everything ties to everything. Um, But I, you know, as an historian, I'm always looking for the ways in which you can understand present behavior based on things that have occurred in the past. And I don't think you can understand any of the U.S.-French relationship unless you understand this fundamental issue of the way that the United States went through everything it could possibly think of before turning to Charles de Gaulle. Well, Michael, we want to thank you so much for joining us today. We want to remind people that your book is called When France Fell. uh, And uh, it's it's also the winner of the Society for Military History's Distinguished Book Award. So it's got lots to recommend it. And I know Chris and I would both recommend reading this book. Uh, Definitely worth the time putting into it. Thank you so much for joining us on the program today. Thank you. Forgive me for the the, the cold. No, no. No, And if you ever, if you were, if you were starting to flag, we were just going to say Charles de Gaulle to wake you up. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. So, Chris, uh, great show. Good job. Um, uh, Next week. Next week. Next, Next week, year. Chris and I are going it alone. Yeah, I know. So help us out here, folks. No guest, right? It's just the two of us. <laughs> yeah. Just the two of us. And we are looking at you, viewers, to find out questions or subjects that you want us to talk about. Don't put them on the Facebook thing here or the YouTube thing here. Email them to us at info at historyhappyhour.net. You can do it today. You can do it in the first few days of next week. We've gotten a few already, uh, and so we're uh, excited about that. You could also post questions on our Facebook page, uh, and so there's lots of ways to get that to us, but we'll take a look at what you send. We'll find some stuff to talk about. Maybe there will be other stuff suggested in the moment. And Rick, and if not, we'll talk about you know, favorite books. Rick can be your personal shopper for Christmas. And... Absolutely. Uh, and uh, we can always talk about football as long as it's the kind where you're, you're throwing the ball. Nope, and all the right I'm teams, out, I'm out, I'm out, I'm all out. the right teams lost today. So it's, it's a very sad day anyway. So uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Please subscribe thanks, to everybody. us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook. Shout at us on Twitter. Listen to our podcast. Back us on Patreon and browse History Happy Hour. Thanks, everybody. Be safe.